During the 20th century, the Soviet Union built many, let's say, interesting and unconventional military vehicles. In fact, the Soviets seemed to be unmatched when it came to building and testing unconventional and unusual military machines. In some instances, they get an A for effort. But for the most part, these vehicles simply make no sense. Today we explore some of the more unusual. Let's start with a vehicle we have featured on the channel before, the Russian Tsar tank. It was developed during the First World War when tanks were making their debut on the battlefield. In 1915, a Russian engineer came up with a tank design that went beyond weird. A design that in fact looked nothing like what you'd imagine a tank looking like. It looked more like a massive piece of artillery than a tank. The most distinguishing feature of the Tsar tank was its two massive spoked wheels, which measured nine meters or 30 feet in diameter. They were powered by two 240 horsepower Macbeth engines that were taken from Zeppelins. The third wheel was mounted to the rear and measured only 1.5 meters or five feet and was non-powered. The large wheels were intended to allow the tank to cross significant obstacles, such as trenches, shell craters, trees, and structures such as houses. For a whole host of reasons, the design was flawed from the start, and the Tsar tank never made it past the first field test when it got stuck, and all efforts to free it, well, they failed. It was left where it sat for almost eight years before it was dismantled and scrapped. It seems like a terrible waste. The 2B1 Oka, also known as Oka, was a hilariously large self-propelled heavy artillery system developed during the early days of the Cold War. It was equipped with a massive 420 millimeter or 16.5 inch gun and had a mass of 55.3 tons. Wow, that's big. The Oka was designed to fire a 750 kilogram round up to 45 kilometers. That's 28 miles. Well, that is certainly impressive. Its low rate of fire only allowed it to fire one round every five minutes. And the recoil of the gun was so strong that it caused damage to various components, such as the drive sprockets and the gearbox. Due to its massive size, it was incredibly difficult to transport. Only four Okas were produced, with further development of the 2B1 Oka ultimately abandoned in 1960 in favor of tactical ballistic missiles. The Oka is considered the largest self-propelled mortar in history and is a testament to the Soviet Union's pursuit of military dominance during the Cold War, even if it was, like the Tsar tank, a failure. The concept for the 1K17 Shaddy seems like something right out of Star Wars, but it was in fact a real attempt by the Soviets to develop a laser weapon. Laser. Also known as compression, the 1K17 Shaddy was a self-propelled laser vehicle developed during the final years of the Cold War. It was the world's first laser-armed vehicle and it was designed to disable the optical electronic equipment of enemy missiles, ground, and aerial vehicles. The platform used a Mista 7 chassis with a battery of laser projectors mounted in the turret. The Shaddy was first developed in the 1970s with a revised design coming in the late 1980s. And only two prototypes were ever built. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the development was abandoned due to its high cost and perceived lack of necessity. Well, unlike the two previous mentioned designs that seemed doomed from the start, the Shaddy was proven to be effective as both a defensive and offensive weapon. During testing, it knocked out the optical system of a helicopter at a range of six miles and disabled the aircraft's avionics entirely at five miles. But had it entered service, it might have been a violation of the Geneva Convention. After the project was terminated, one of the prototypes was scrapped, and the other is displayed in the Army Technology Museum near Moscow without its laser projector. 
The T-55 main battle tank was developed in the years after World War II. It served the Soviets as well as the militaries of other countries well for decades. But there is always room for improvement over the original design. One of the more unique modifications of the T-55 was the addition of a jet engine, not to make it go faster, but to serve as a gas dynamic mine clearing system. Designated the T-55 Progrev T, the tank was modified and fitted with a MiG-15 jet engine, which was used to create a powerful blast of air capable of detonating landmines without harming the tank. This unconventional design was fielded for a period in Afghanistan where it was used for mine clearing operations and seemed to work as intended, although with some limitations. The effectiveness of the Progrev T in mine clearing operations was likely constrained by the tank's primary design as a combat vehicle. The number produced is not specifically known, but most likely it saw very limited production. And the reason why the concept was abandoned, well, that's also up for speculation. The Yakovlev Yak-36, known by its NATO reporting name, Freehand, was a demonstrator for a vertical takeoff and landing combat aircraft, similar to the British Harrier. Development began in the early 1960s, with the first untethered hovering occurring on January 9, 1963, and its first full flight taking place in 1966. It was publicly displayed at an air show in 1967, and when it was, it caught NATO by surprise. The Yak-36, named after its brainchild, Alexander Yakovlev, was powered by two non-afterburning R27-300 turbojet engines, each producing 11,000 pounds of thrust. These engines were equipped with vectorable nozzles that could be rotated through 90 degrees, allowing for vertical lift. It did have its flaws, which would ultimately result in the termination of the project before it could become fully operational. It lacked an acceptable combat range and was underpowered. And one of the more frightening flaws was its tendency to flip over and crash should one of the two engines stall. That sounds bad. All the research, however, was not in vain. The lessons learned from the testing of the Yak-36 would lead to the development of the successful Yak-38 Forger. What the Tsar tank was to tanks, the Kalilin K-7 was to aircraft. The K-7 was a huge experimental aircraft designed to service multiple roles, from a heavy bomber to a troop or civilian transport. It had an unusual configuration to say the least. Designed and tested in the early 1930s, the K-7 had twin booms and large underwing pods housing fixed landing gear and machine gun turrets. The airframe was welded from KHMA chrome molybdenum steel. In the passenger version, seats were arranged inside the 2.3 meter thick wings. As many of the Soviet designs, size was a factor during the K-7 planning. The aircraft was a giant hulking creation with a wingspan of 173 feet, 11 inches, and a length of 91 feet, 10 inches. In its civilian transport configuration, it had a capacity of 120 passengers and 7,000 kilograms of mail. As a troop transport, it had a capacity of 112 fully equipped paratroopers. And in its bomber configuration, it would have been armed with auto cannons, machine guns, and up to 9,600 kilograms of bombs. Despite its impressive design, only one example of the K-7 was produced. It completed only seven test flights before a crash due to structural failure of one of the tail booms in November of 1933. This would lead to the project's cancellation in 1935. Around 1960, then-Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev bragged that the Soviet Union had ships that could jump over bridges. What he was referring to was the KM Okranoplan, also known as the Caspian Sea Monster. Monster, monster, monster. It was a colossal airship hybrid designed to fly at low altitudes over water, taking advantage of the ground effect to achieve 
efficiency, and speed. The ground effect phenomena occurs when air becomes compressed between the wing and the ground, in this case, the water. This happens because the wing is configured low to the ground. As a result, a cushion of air is created between the wing and the ground, which reduces drag and increases efficiency. The KM Akranoplan was the largest of its kind, with a reported top speed of 311 miles per hour and a wingspan of 148 feet. Its main purpose was to demonstrate the feasibility of this type of aircraft. Due to its ability to fly at low altitudes, it was difficult to detect by radar, making it an intriguing military concept. It was initially seen as a promising vehicle for military and rescue operations, as it could quickly transport personnel or equipment over large expanses of water. The first ever Akronoplan named Corobel Make It was tested in the Caspian Sea in 1966. However, the KM Akronoplan met a tragic end when it crashed in 1980, leading to its abandonment at the bottom of the Caspian Sea. Now, despite its impressive capabilities, the project was ultimately not used as a weapon of war. In the category of all-terrain vehicles, the Zil 4904, also known as the Crazy Screwdrive Vehicle, may be one of the most unique. Developed in 1972, it was the world's largest screw-propelled vehicle, powered by two 180-horsepower engines. The vehicle's distinctive feature was its use of large screws for propulsion, allowing it to traverse various challenging terrains, including deep snow, fragile ice, and swampy areas. The Zil 4904 was designed for snow and swamp traversal, making it suitable for search and rescue operations in difficult environmental conditions. However, despite its innovative design and impressive capabilities, the Soviets ultimately struggled to find a practical use for the vehicle, and it was soon retired. The screw-driven design was resurrected with the creation of the Zil 2906. It was developed to pick up cosmonauts who parachuted down to the plains of Kazakhstan in the re-entry capsules. It continues in service to this day. Unlike many of the strange Russian machines we have talked about so far, the Aerosled, or Aerosani, was actually a good idea that found itself being used in various different roles and by more than just the Russians. An aerosled is essentially a sledge, sleigh, or toboggan on runners or skis powered by a propeller. Some resemble a car without wheels or a small airplane fuselage mounted on skis with a giant propeller mounted to the rear. The first aerosled is thought to have been built around 1903. Igor Sikorsky, who would go on to build some iconic airplanes and helicopters, tested an aerosled around 1909. A version of the aerosled was used during the First World War for reconnaissance, communications, and raiding. Aerosleds with machine guns mounted to them were used during the Winter War. The Server II aerosled was built in 1959 when Soviet engineers mounted a Yak-12 airplane engine onto a Gaz M20 sedan. It was used for communications, mail deliveries, medical aid, emergency recovery, and border patrolling in northern Russia. In addition to Russia, aerosleds are used for various purposes in countries such as Canada, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Germany. If I say flying tank, the American A-10 Warthog is probably the first thing that comes to mind. Well, long before the A-10 made its first flight, the Russians built a flying tank, literally. They did what? The Antonov AN-40 Krylea Tanka, which literally translates to tank wings, was designed in 1942. The concept was simple. Put giant wings on a tank and then tow it behind a bomber. Once over the battlefield, it would be released and glide to the ground where its wings would be jettisoned and it would turn into a conventional tank. While it was a pioneering attempt to provide air support to ground forces, it was found to be unworkable and the project ultimately canceled. Well, I'm not surprised. There are many more examples of strange Russian machines we could talk about, and we will, but not today.
One Russian design that was anything but a failure is the MiG-31 Foxhound. It, along with the American SR-71, are two of the most iconic aircraft ever built. In fact, the SR-71 inspired the MiG-31. It was part of the Soviet scheme to intercept and shoot down the Blackbird. To discover more and to hear the story of the time a MiG-31 pilot intercepted the Blackbird, click the screen now. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you smash that like button and leave us a comment below. And until next time, I'm Dennis Gill for Revealing History.